Hi, everyone. Welcome to the timingresearch.com crowd forecast news, episode number uh, 323 for December 13th, 2021. We are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of timingresearch.com. And you should be seeing my screen right now. So we're going to start out talking about the S&P 500 and uh, move on to other topics related to the market this week. And today I have arranged for Doc Severson to join us again, as well as Sonny Harris. And the option professor is back to moderate. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Okay, a big uh, Monday here, a little bit of selling coming on. So it'll be interesting to see what everybody thinks is happening currently and maybe between now and the next six weeks through the uh, January effect. Um, let's start out before we get into the markets and everything, introduce uh, each other and, um, and again, uh, a little bit of background of what your company's doing. Uh, Sonny, could you start out in a little background on yourself? I know it's extensive, so you'll cut it down, but a uh, little background and what's going on at your company. Well, uh, I'm a mathematician. I have uh, three degrees in math and one in photography. And I sponsor the Money Mentor on the internet. And I've been trading for 41 years, and I trade every day, uh, trade the S&P, and I guess that's about it. Yeah, you got a very good uh, proprietary indicator, the Sunny Bands, which we're going to get into a little later, but those are fascinating. And people that are unaware uh, of those, uh, I think it'd be worthwhile for them to find out, right? That'd be a good idea. They could go exactly. to moneymentor.com and find out all they want to know. There you go. Uh, Doc, a uh, little bit about yourself and also uh, what's going on at your company. Hey, uh, Jim, David, and Sonny, good good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Again, everybody, my name is Doc Severson. I'm the co-founder of Ready, Set, Trade. I'm the guy that quit his six-figure telecommunications job and went solo to trade back in 2005. And it seems like as soon as I did, I got requested almost at gunpoint into helping other people do the same thing. And I found I really enjoyed it enjoy helping people connect the dots to see the, how they can create value and income on their own in the market. So at Ready, Set, Trade, we have a whole suite of services with a community of traders centered around the live market sessions that I do, which includes a nightly newsletter. We publish every trade live to our traders, and we focus on a blended approach in the market with options, premium selling, as well as directional swing trades. Our specialty these days is the zero DTE trade on the SBX, where we're winning at about a 97% clip this year. We even have a free community, which I'll talk about at the end of today's program. Thank you, Jim. Sure. And uh, Doc, could you just uh, say that uh, specialty, uh, the zero SPX trade or what's it? Zero DTE or zero days to expiration. So on okay. Monday, Wednesday and Friday, we have a zero day option. So we, we trade those. I got you. No, that's interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, every Monday morning, we do wake up, have our little coffee or tea, whatever. And then we also uh, try to find out uh, where people think the market may be by Friday. So <clears throat> we opened today higher uh, at 47.10. But uh, between 47.10, which was the SPX opening, and Friday's close, um, up sideways or lower and then of course your confidence level sunny i think we're still going up i think we're still going up and i'm never more than about 50 50 because i'm such a short-term trader i do trade five minute charts five right. and one minute actually <clears throat> uh so you know those go up and down really fast but right i don't know we've we've got a red bar right now and it's down uh 31 points so using my sunny bands, I uh, think it's going to drop to the midline, which is at, let me see here, 46.36, and then bounce on up again. Yeah, there seems to be a little bit of a gap there uh, between 4,600 ballpark and around that level. So maybe it might uh, go into that neighborhood a little bit. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, uh, more likely than not, but nothing... Uh, nothing uh, higher than that. And again, like you were saying, when you're working with the shorter term stuff, you're going to be as flexible as can be on what you really think, because uh, you could change your opinion way before Friday. Oh, goodness, many times. Yeah, I, exactly. I generally make five to 10 trades a day. Right, right. So it's a question that we do throw out there, uh, but it's not in everyone's wheelhouse as exactly how they operate. Uh, Doc, how do you feel between now and Friday uh, with the 4710? You got a head start if you think it's going lower, but uh, what do you think? 
I, I would say if I'm going out like a month or two months, I would say my confidence level is very, very high to be higher. But I think in the short term, I think there's so many people that are leaning long right now. Yeah. And the obvious trade is to the long side. I think there's okay. a very good chance that we go down and fill some gaps and clean up some garbage on this chart before we get what I believe might be the final move higher into yeah. um, early 22. I was noticing the 50 day moving average on the uh, SPX is around 45, 75 area. And that's about 2% lower than we are. And, uh, you know, that's probably about as far down as you'd like to see it go if you want to stay bullish. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a long time since the S&P has uh, touched a 200-day moving average. And so we're certainly a little bit overdue for that. Yeah. And I think if that happens, we would probably reset this chart for six to nine months. I yeah. don't see that happening just yet, though. I also um, follow the VIX very closely. Um, uh, Sonny, you follow the VIX uh, at all? I do not. It, uh, I do not, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. It's been pretty good. You know, when it gets to 25, 35, it's generally a, a pretty good buying opportunity. And now it's corrected from 35 all the way down to like 18. And now it seems to be uh, finding a little more of a comfort level above 19, 20. If that, if that persists, that might be a little bit of a head, uh, a little bit of a tell that uh, a further correction could happen. You know, do you watch it at all, uh, Dr. Vix? Oh yeah, sure. I've watched yeah. the Vix, but I, I don't use it necessarily predictively unless we have a positive divergence showing up down there. Yeah, yeah. Like we did, um, I think it was in uh, October, September, where um, the market made a little bit of a lower low, but the VIX never did. So that's kind of a divergence there. Mm -hmm. And that obviously was a great buying opportunity back at that time frame. So, um, okay, um, with regards to uh, things that you're watching uh, technically or fundamentally, Sonny, a uh, little bit of an idea of what's in your uh, secret sauce as far as, you know, uh, the next short term. And let's take it through the end of January because that's the January effect. So in the next six weeks or so, uh, maybe the next two weeks between now and the end of the year, and then the next six weeks, which takes you through January. What are you thinking as far as what's going to move the markets or, you know, that kind of thing? Well, it's interesting to see that the Dow and the uh, S&P and the NASDAQ are, are not completely in tune with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dow has not made new highs. The ES did make new highs. Uh, and let's see, at in Q here, look at this chart. And that was lagging too. Uh, so those two could drag the ES down. Mm -hmm. But I think, nevertheless, that we're going to be going up for the, uh, until Christmas time. And uh, my friend Larry Williams, everybody knows Larry Williams, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, thinks that the Christmas, the Santa Claus rally is taking over. So, is, he, uh, is he looking for um, uh, a last week of the year uh, drop because of um, uh, harvesting of losses? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, he you know, in other words, to offset the gains. If you had, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. sure, I understand. Is it window dressing? Yeah. Um, so he says that it usually goes up, and he studies years and years and years of patterns. And it goes up from about the 15th of December to the end, according to Larry Williams. And, uh, you know, my, my view of it looks like it's going to go on up uh, at least till the, until January. After January, all bets are off. I don't know. Um, as, as goes January, so goes the rest of the year, they say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't know. I think that we oh, somewhere we're going to have a correction. Don't know where, don't know when, but it's coming. Anything on a technical or fundamental basis that you're kind of looking at uh, that would give you some uh, tips on what you think is happening? I look exclusively at sunny bands. It's mathematical. It avoids whipsaw. Uh, it it uh, calls the tops and the bottoms for me, and it's just pointing straight up right now. I just looked at the weekly chart and it's been up since the COVID crash. It's just been above the, the center lines, above what I call the midline. And uh, when it drops, it's gonna drop pretty nicely, I think. And I'm looking forward to that. I love trading shorts. Um, 
some people were saying um, like Apple's performance in the last five years, it's averaging about 45% or something. And then the last three years, it's averaging 62%. And some people are saying, and it's about 7% of the S&P. And then I think there's about 10 stocks that represent about 40%. And all of them have really had very large moves. Would you say that that's a little bit of a common sense thing that repeating those type of performance numbers in the next three to five years would be very difficult? I don't think it'd be difficult at all. Everybody loves that Apple watch okay. and, and the iPhone. And of course, they're buying them all for Christmas right now. Right. So 62% uh, returns um, and 45% annualized, you think they're, they're, um, they're repeatable? I do, I do. Okay, yeah. Well, cause like I say, some people might think that that's kind of aggressive returns and at some point they slow down, but- And it but, is very aggressive, but they've been doing that for some time and there's no slowdown. I mean, I'm an, I'm an old Android person myself. And, right. You know, I'm a Windows user but a lot of people like that uh, ease of use of the apples oh there's no doubt about it uh, there's that's not really it's just it's gone from one trillion to three trillion in a uh, 36 months or no a little over two years well it was it's a two a, trillion at the beginning of the year and it's a, nearly yeah. a three trillion now right so they said something about it. it went from one to three trillion in two and a half years and you know some might think that that's a fairly um, accelerating price um almost giving a feeling of, uh, you know, uh, what's that effect? What's that effect called that things, things double by halves? You know, it goes up, uh, from 2 what's billion, that, 2 that trillion Moore's, to Moore's law. Is that it? Yes. Yes. That's it. So it goes up from 2 billion, 2 trillion, sorry, to 3 trillion in a year. Maybe it'll go on up faster than that. You know, another 50% up in the, in half a year. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, like, you know, if they keep bringing the uh, net income in like they have, obviously, they had about $94 billion of net income in the last 12 months, they said, and that is a lot of money. It's like about, uh, um, you know, four times uh, or three times uh, Amazon's net income. So that gives you mm -hmm. an idea how much money Apple's making. Anyway, oh, yeah. Doc, uh, what are you looking at as far as behind the curtain, uh, as far as, um, you know, fundamental or technical things that you think will be important in the next uh, two to six weeks? I'm, I'm seeing shades of 2007 again. I, I guess that's where I'm coming from because we have, uh, we've generally been long since near the bottom of the, the pandemic. Right. And this is, this is a very characteristic uh, is what I call it an S shaped market. So we start off real strong. We get kind of fat in the middle and consolidate. And then usually there's a screaming move into the end. And that mm -hmm. normally marks it. This is where everybody chases after the very, very tail of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2018 was a great example. The first month of 2018 as we got through 2017 from that. But so I'm, I'm kind of looking at this as I'm waiting for that final move because I think uncertainty is going to come rushing into the markets, if not already now, but beyond the ability for the market to, to discount it next year. So mm -hmm. I am not a bear Ultimately, I'm, you know, generally a bull 99% of the time, but I'm looking at this sort of final move to trim risk into that. I'm seeing things like the, uh, right now, only 70% of the S&P members are in uptrends. So 30% mm -hmm. of them, fully 30% of them have already slipped down. And I'm, I'm seeing that on assets just about everywhere. This is a real stock picker's market. If you're not in the right mm -hmm. stocks, and we've seen this before too, where literally five stocks can power the entire market before it just falls into a heap, you know, over the course of a couple of days. The other thing I'm seeing too is the Russell 2000, which is kind of a canary in a coal mine, right? So when the Russell starts to fall, you have to pay attention to that because the Russell is a risk barometer to fund managers and they can't get out of these things very easily. So it's very illiquid holding. So they have to either manipulate into a high, which is what they did recently, yeah. or, you know, very quickly sell out. So you know what risk managers are thinking in terms of risk on based on what the Russell's doing. And Russell's just getting crushed lately. Yeah, so, IWM is the one that I follow on that. And mm -hmm. uh, it had a wall of voodoo at 230 ballpark area. They broke through that to 245-ish area. Mm -hmm. And then somebody obviously was fading that move in a big way because now we're back in the 215 holding on for dear life. Yeah, 
push them so, up to sell them. You know, create the liquidity event that you need to be able to distribute inventory. That, I mean, that somebody did that example. there. I, you know, I'd love to know the the names on the sell tickets uh, up above two forty because those people obviously uh, uh, knew more than the rest or got very lucky. But uh, it'd be interesting to uh, get the names on the sell tickets up there because you know it it looks clearly like somebody got uh, duped into a false breakout, and now this thing is uh, well, yeah retail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and in this thing now, uh, you know, it had a nice little bounce back uh, to 225 area and that and they couldn't get through that 225 area. And now they're back at 215 on IWM. So if it, if it starts taking out 210, uh, that would be kind of a serious uh, blow to uh, the IWM. Yeah, if you look at uh, 2008, the Russell led all markets lower for yeah. a while into, yeah. you know, halfway into 2008, and everybody had this false sense of security that, oh, well, this is just even, I remember the pundits call it a cub market at the time. They didn't think it was a true bear market yet. And of course, you know, we, we know what was yet to come, but the Russell was leading to the downside and it's doing it right now. So I wouldn't be surprised to see us just rip higher into the first couple of months of 2022. Just mm -hmm. unbelievable to the point where everybody's like, you know, the, the party hats and the confetti are coming out again at CNBC. And they get that the sideline money in to provide liquidity for the people who need liquidity. Right. And so that may be the time to uh, start to thin out your inventory, I believe. Yeah. Um, with regards, yeah, because, you know, that was an all-time high they made on the Russell when they took it up to 244 on IWM. And now it's uh, it's right back under pressure. Um do you ever look at the um, uh, transports at all? Um, I used to do that whole Dow theory thing with the industrials and the transports. And, you know, there were some people that followed them, that theory. But uh, to me, the transports have been, you know, just sort of uh, run over by technology. Technology is not what 28% of the S&P. So I really just follow the, the S&P sectors now. Yeah. Uh, no, I and, don't even, I don't even, uh, I, I did the Dow theory thing too with the transports and the Dow. Um, I don't even think that it's the Dow or the S and P really that's leading anymore. It's the Nasdaq with all the yeah. all the tech stocks in there. Yeah, because uh, growth has obviously had a very good long run. I think uh, they said in the last I don't know how many years, fifty years. There's only been four down years in growth. Well, the transportation, if you think about it, transportation now is all electronic. We're doing everything over Zoom or uh, go to webinar, or, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm just so wondering, like, I mean, somebody's still got to get the stuff from the port of LA into the stores. So there's your trains and your trucks, and uh, they still got to get their packages from Amazon, from their warehouse to your house. So that should be UPS, FedEx, et cetera. But, um, you know, those stocks, um, uh, you know, have not been exactly jumping through the roof. The transport uh, is at 16,000 and change. It topped out in November, what would it be? November, December, six weeks ago uh, at about 18,000 and is trading at 16,000. So there's some, uh, there's definitely some uh, uh, cooling off in the transportation average. And what but do you think is going to happen when the transportation is all done by Tesla trucks, self-driving trucks? Yeah, like I say, that maybe uh, people are uh, front running that concept and they're saying uh, that the, the standard guys uh, that you work with, which are the trucking and the railroads, are going to be damaged by that. But, uh, you know, um, the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, we're not at 18,000 and change on the transport. We're at 16,000 and we're going into Christmas time, which supposedly is going to have all these deliveries. So it's confusing to some people, I think. But uh, anyway, let's keep moving forward here a little bit and uh, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the, uh, do you have any specific uh, transactions or sectors or anything, uh, Sonny, that you want to share um, coming up shortly that you think uh, look timely? You know, I, I really firmly believe in trading the things you know. Yeah. So I trade um, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, because I use Windows operating system. Sure. Um, Amazon is one of the most tradable stocks. Now, I, I like when it goes up and then back down and up and back down like that. Mm -hmm. There's lots of area for profit on a short-term basis. Mm -hmm. I trade and Tesla. So you, you're sticking with, mostly Tesla. with large cap tech. Is that would you say that you're a large cap tech trader more, more often? Uh, for, well, I actually am a long-term 
uh, tech trader from a, uh, you know, just a long-term basis. Yeah. I don't trade those as much as I, of course, I trade the E-mini one in five minutes every day, but these, okay. I, I swing trade. Yeah. So I'll pick off each one of those moves up and down again. Right. Uh, so on the, on, the, on the large cap tech, you might do so. You obviously have some what they call core holdings. And then against those core holdings, uh, you may do some trading on a swing basis. When you see like, you know, we go down to 3330 on Amazon, you might take a bite down there. It runs up 100 or two or even less. And you maybe take some off the table that way. Exactly. Uh, my theory is that you can only catch about, <clears throat> pardon me, about 60% of a move. Right. You, you usually get in on 20% late and you get out 20% late, but look at those moves. Yeah. There's lots yeah. of money there. No, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. And then as far as the E-mini S&P, that's the one you keep on the shortest leash because obviously it's a very liquid uh, thing and uh, you're trying to, you know, catch more, uh, you know, shorter term swings, but also trying to take risk off the table as quickly as possible, right? Very quickly. Yeah. Very in other words, you know, you'll get in there because you think something's happening. Once it happens, you're either going to get out or if it stops happening, you're out right away. That kind of thing. Yeah, I'm out instantly. I've got my finger on the close button to yeah. close the trade. And, um, you know, I do trade on one in five minute charts. And I my goal is to pull out a thousand dollars of the market every day. Yeah. And, you know, people that want to um, uh, employ that type of uh, tactic, uh, that would be useful information that you'd be providing. I'd be happy to. Yeah. Um, even today, you know, well, like we were just saying, uh, it opened at 47.10 on the SPX, uh, whatever the E-mini is similar. And so you've had a nice 40-point uh, move to the downside. So if you yep. sold it anywhere near yep. the opening, put a stop above the high and let it ride, and you, you could make uh, some good money even today. Absolutely. Uh, Doc, uh, some of the, uh, you know, a little bit more granular and some of the strategies and some of the markets that you're kind of focused on? You know, 90% of what I'm doing is is on the S&P. And the, the S&P has is, is got so many different ways to trade it these days. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's just fantastic. I mean, not mm -hmm. only the the zero DTE options that we mm -hmm. talked about, which are written on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the spiders and on the, the full S&P. Mm -hmm. So we're doing those. We're also doing uh, some of the 45 days to expiration, just the, the constant ladder strategies for, you know, two to three times a week, you're just adding positions and you're just adding and subtracting inventory. And you're just looking for, you know, what they call as long theta. You're just looking for time value to decay on these positions. And you have very set defensive strategies for that, as well as something that we're getting into recently, which is the micro E-mini futures options, especially on the MES. So this is the micro Yes, contract has yeah, they're, they're 10 it. bucks a point, right? Um, yeah, that's that's what it is. Yeah, because it's a oh, it's isn't a it five dollars a point or is it five? Yeah, it's it's five dollars a point, so it's a multiplier of five on the contract, so five bucks per point, which is versus 50 bucks a point on the main. Yes, right, right. And, you know, right. leverage, leverage is uh, uh, the uh, death knoll of a lot of traders. So um, having a vehicle in there where you can use less leverage can be very helpful to people as far as managing risk, right? Yeah, even on larger accounts, I'm finding people on larger accounts are using the micro e minis just because they, they use span margin on them. And it's very, very efficient compared to most reg T margin. So you're able to very, very nicely... Uh, dovetail and, and kind of design a trade, which is perfectly designed for your risk characteristics. And you kind oh, of uh, multi nice. multi leg uh, going in and multi leg going out generally. Uh, you know, for those, I've I've experimented with a lot of different. Now the the disadvantage to those contracts is typically the commission structure is not as good as with ex equity options. Right. So what I'll do is with those specifically, I'll use something like a naked put, which is maybe at a ten delta. And it's just a very, very efficient trade. We get in and, you know, get out of it once we've burned off about 50% of the value of it and just keep rolling along. And the defense for these is actually very, very simple. So it's just a very simple and effective trade. Could you explain real quick? With, okay. the, um, yes, mm -hmm. with the micro, the problem is it's a, uh, I pay $1.20 a side commission on the E-mini and $1.20 a side on the micro. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. 
you know, I mean, you need to be paying 12 cents on the micro because it, it's, you lose a lot on just paying for the broker's fees when you can only make a few dollars. Yeah, oh, I mean, if you're, if you're doing extremely short-term trading and you're using micros, those, uh, those commissions would be very prohibitive. If yeah, you were doing I mean, swing trading, uh, maybe it wouldn't be as important. The more important thing is, is you have less leverage. And based on the size of your account, less leverage could be an effective way of trying to, you know, manage risk. Well, the, the micros, um, I see the, the e-mini is 12,000 something for the margin. And then their micros 1,200. So people with smaller accounts could certainly trade that one effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this uh, zero um, um, uh, DTE, um, just a, a hypothetical theoretical example. Um, can we get one from you, um, Doc? Yeah, what we're looking for is, now I, do, I don't use any kind of uh, technical analysis during the day on these because any, any kind of any kind of trailing study like that is just not going to be fast enough. So I just very simply use the opening range. And I also use the plus and minus expected move for the day, which we calculate right at the opening bell. And it generates these price frames. And so you quickly can determine whether or not a day is going to be a trend day versus a range day. Today was a great example of a trend day. I mean, the opening range started and it was just one continual push to the downside. And so my call at that point at 10.05 this morning to my room was, we got a trend day here. We're gonna we're gonna back off. You know, we're gonna wave off of this one. So we're just looking for these are iron condor variants. Typically, what I'll trade is an iron butterfly because they're very very fast. The mm -hmm. other day, I was in and out with hundred dollars per contract in nine minutes, which is, you know, it, it's that's so much more efficient for your time versus trading something with you know like a five or six delta short iron condor where you basically are waiting all day long you feel like you're sitting on an egg all day long waiting for it to hatch and be relieved of your obligation so i take the opposite <laughs> effect i i look to get in get my fair share and get out as soon as possible sure okay so i get a little bit of an idea on that um with regards to uh different uh, things that are going on sector wise um, could we look at a couple of different ones and you guys give us an idea on that? Uh, if we put up the XLE, um, see it a little bit about what energy looks like to you guys. Um, and then maybe some of the people out there who are looking at different sectors might find that interesting. Like, uh, um, can you get an opinion from uh, Sonny and uh, Doc on uh, energy, starting out with Sonny? Well, I think the energy's, uh, it's a crazy market. Um, I did a chart the other day that was the price of gasoline versus the price of oil and found that uh, on my analysis, at least, that the price of gas stayed high even while oil was coming down and, and, and the, reached the, the high while oil was still coming down. So that's an interesting thing. And yesterday at the pump, I filled up my car. It's $5.15 a gallon here in San Diego. So I think, I think the energy fields... Uh, hot mm -hmm. and so you think xle still has some potential i do i do okay. it's been going that that chart looks effectively sideways to me yeah i mean it, it's not a it's not a real down move it's a lot of volatility and a lot of sideways action and uh, typically when you go sideways that long you're looking for another uh well a move in either direction but i think we're likely to go up on that one you look at that moving average and see it's hit the moving average and uh it's got a lot of support i think there how about you doc how do you feel about energy i'm i'm a little less bullish on it right now i'm seeing uh, some negative divergence showing up and we're we're slowing down the the bounce off of the bottom you know mm -hmm. after all those years where we just kept driving lower and lower Right. Uh, so this is almost uh, just like a, a monthly lower high setting up right now. And the, the concern that I have with energy is, is this current administration, not to be political here, but they're, uh, they're making it tough on the energy industry overall. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is going to cap the upside. So right now I'm just, you know, I see more of the sideways churn for at least the next few months. Let's take a look at the financials. Those are the banks and all those kind of guys, XLF. And uh, 
A lot of people are thinking that uh, with a higher interest rate environment, these guys are going to take off. Do you feel like uh, there's a lot of potential in this one? Uh, or do you think, uh, you know, the JP Morgans and the city groups and the Wells Fargo's and Morgan Stanley's are going to have a harder time making money? I think they're going to have a harder time because of a, uh, a real estate uh, regrouping that I think I see coming. Uh, the prices of, I watch Zillow.com and create a little chart from, uh, the housing market by looking at the price of my own house right and it, it has begun to stagnate a little real estate market's not as hot as it was no people are don't have an income like they used to have people that don't have an income like they used to have um and that makes them the hard COVID to qualify thing. for the higher loan right yeah and exactly and so with people struggling i think we're going to have a problem with real estate maybe some more foreclosures yeah. and if that happens then Financial and the, bank, then the really banks would have risk on all those loans they've got out. Exactly. How about you, Doc? How do you feel about the financials? I, I think so goes the 10-year note, so goes the financials. Uh, the 10-year note has not been breaking out any higher above 1.7% recently. So we've had a couple of lower highs in there. And to me, until the 10-year note, until, we, until the market, the bond market actually starts to price in inflation, then I think uh, financials are going to stagnate. Why don't we uh, throw up TLT and that'll give them a, a good idea of uh, a vehicle. Cause this is something I've been bullish on since March and every time it pulls back, I, you know, I think it's a buying opportunity because the whole world is talking higher interest rates and uh, the TLT is not talking like that at all. So what do you guys think about the TLT? I mean, obviously people think it's going to go to 140 and 130, and it may do that, but uh, Right now, it looks like if there would be a surprise, it might be a surprise to the upside. It does look like that, but it also looks like a five wave just completed. And we've got the correction in, it's coming back up in a, in a B. Right. Uh, it could go a little higher on a B wave and then right. coming back down on a, on a C. I got you. So the jury's not totally out on that one. My jury's not. Yeah. My All right, let's, uh, let's switch over to a couple of the ones that are kind of hot that everyone, uh, there's three of them that are pretty hot. First one is uh, Tech, XLK. And uh, what do you think, uh, Doc, on this one? I think this is going to just absolutely run into a screaming high here, uh, I'd say in the next few months. Like Probably a, sometime in the first half of 2022. This looks like it's ready to just go into a blow off top. Well, you know, if the TLT does like the charter saying, which is meaning the yields are not going to be going up on the 10 year, then obviously this is a very interest rate sensitive sector. And if there is a sigh of relief on an interest rate yield jumping, there'll be a big sigh of relief on these things too, wouldn't there be? Mm -hmm. And that might explain the technicals you're talking about, which is it looks like it wants to pop hard. But uh what do you think, uh, Sonny, on the uh, on the tech? You uh, generally that, that, are pretty positive on that. That one, yeah, I am positive on it, and that one looks like it just started a new one way. So mm -hmm. I think we've got one, three, and five on the upside. Yeah. So any pullback would be a little bit of a bargain. Buy the pullbacks. That's what yeah. I try to do. All right, let's go to the other part of tech, which is semis, SMH. Uh, I was reading uh, that uh, China is having these lockdowns again and 17 factories have been closed. Uh, one of them is in uh, auto parts and the other one is in uh, uh, electronics. Uh, so there is some thinking that uh, the chip uh, problem for cars and, uh, and other chips might be problematic. What are you thinking here on the semis? Uh, Doc? Mm. Oh, it doesn't, uh, I think Samsung is putting a new plant up in Texas. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the cavalry is on the way, yeah. I believe, for this. And what I'm seeing here, just technically, if I didn't know anything about the news, I'm looking at this perfect high and tight consolidation. Right. Nice little box consolidation up there, the tighter, the better. And that should spring above 315. And Sonny, how do you feel about the semis? I would agree with, his, with Doc's analysis of that. Uh, I mean, everything we do now is semiconductor, isn't it? Yeah. And then if you have a, a, any kind of a disruption of the supply of them, obviously the ones that have supplies probably charge up for them, right? Exactly. Price will go up if it's limited supply. Yeah. And again, uh, 
they have a zero tolerance for any of this COVID over there in China. So they seem to not uh, care too much about the ramifications of shutting factories down totally. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting that that's happening. Yeah. Um, all right. So those two look uh, like pretty good. And what about XLY? That's your consumer discretionary. That was going nuts. But I think uh, the bloom came off the rose a little bit. But uh, what do you think about XLY, the consumer discretionary? Uh, I don't think about that one. I, that, it, I mean, it looks like it's putting in a, well, we've got a head and shoulders there that's sloping down. It's not your conventional head and shoulders, but uh, that could, if it is, uh, I could see that dropping on down to about, oh, 192. Mm -hmm. How about you, Doc? How do you feel about the consumer? Discretionary. The, well, the two biggest holdings there are Amazon and Tesla. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Tesla has been, you know, had its had its moments here lately. I don't know if it's just due to Elon selling, but um, you know, look at the look at the the move up into that. You don't get any more vertical than that. So range expansion goes to range contraction. The swing test on this is down about nine hundred, and so it's heading for nine hundred first before it goes higher. I got you. And uh, again, uh, the consumer wages or the uh, people's wages um, based on the inflation are, are negative now. And that dynamic of uh, wages being negative versus the prices uh, could have a little bit of an effect. And maybe that is also an explanation on why the transports are doing uh, not as well, because people might be front running the concept that the consumer uh, will slow down a little bit. And if he does that, there's less things to ship. That could be a, a reasoning behind that as well. That's what interest rates are showing right now. Yeah. Uh, what about um, the uh, home builders, home constructions, ITB? You know, that that's another one that's really gone up. There's supposedly a big housing shortage. And uh, uh, obviously, it's done great. But that big red bar, is it telling us anything uh, on a short-term basis? Or this thing still looks pretty darn good? You know, out here in California, they're building houses as fast as they can go, and they can't meet the demand for them. There's, uh, you know, a definite housing shortage here. But, you know, um, the problem is uh, they're going to overbuild. Builders always overbuild to, yeah, they to do. meet demand, and then they've got a surplus on the market, and then we have a problem. Yeah, I was in uh, Phoenix in the 80s and I saw their debacle. And then I was here in Nevada during the 2008 and I saw that debacle. So, you know, I've seen a uh, tumbleweed on top of uh, projects before. So, you know, uh, this thing doesn't go in one direction all the time forever, you know. Well, China is certainly having a problem with their yeah. uh, real yeah. estate market. You know, they're closing down uh, unfinished projects. Right Here they now. say the millennials are coming into the market. So that's a huge buying source. And again, the availability of affordable homes and stuff is kind of still skinny. So the dynamic here is a little bit different um, than it is elsewhere, which is probably why it's been bid up so nicely. Doc, do you have a feeling on the home construction here? No, as long as rates are low, I think that this will yeah. still continue to trend higher. And if the rates start to, to spike, then yeah, that's, that's going to put a damper on it. All right, here's one I think that everyone is probably wondering about it because, you know, everybody from Tom Lee to uh, Tommy Lee, the drummer on uh, that band, uh, is saying that the reopening trade is going to happen, going to happen, okay? But uh, let's put up some things like the airline. So let's go to, uh, uh, let's say, Delta, D-A-L, and uh, then we'll look at a couple of airlines. So let's look at a couple of airlines. There you go on the airlines. Uh, put another one up. Uh, let's call it um, uh, American Airlines, AAL. And uh, pretty much uh, same story, different airline. And how about uh, JetBlue, J-B-L-U? L-U-V. L-U-V. I like L-U-V. Uh, at least they don't charge for bags and their rates are still cheap. But let's look at L-U-V. Oh, that still looks ter uh, terrible, too. All these well, that's why I love to travel now because it There's doesn't this, cost uh, This yeah. ETF too i think it's pretty new it's a jets, jets but you know jets doesn't give you the same uh, well that's a pretty much same chart you're right uh so you want a one-stop shop you hit jets yeah. if you want to play pick the tail on the pin the tail on the stock we just gave you a few anyway uh sunny starting with you uh, on that reopening trade what do you think uh, i think we've still got downside on that one uh, you know yeah. people still aren't traveling the way they used to no and uh you know with this omicron thing we we're going to be traveling even less again. 
And uh, I don't think that that bodes well for airline stocks at all. Yeah, I've done some traveling myself and it is a task uh, in Hawaii. You got to go on their website. You got to download your documentation and this and that. And it, it, it does take a little bit of the bloom off the rose uh, when you when you go to places and there's that much uh, <clears throat> thing going on. What do you think, Doc? Well, we had a nice reopening spike there, but since that point, it's, um, yeah, it's reality's kicking in right now. So I'm, I would not be bullish on these charts. What about, uh, the, uh, let's go look at some uh, hotels, MAR. And that is hanging in there a little bit better. And what about HLT for Hilton? All right. So what do you guys think of there? Holding on for dear life or about ready to catch the knife? Sonny, what do you think? Uh, that's got a, uh, an ABC down. Looks to me like it's uh, ready to go up again. Okay. So that one looks like it might be better, the hotels. What about uh, you, Doc? You think a little bit better on the hotels than the airlines? Oh, definitely. <laughs> it's, they're above the 200-day moving average. That's It's very simple. Yeah. So the hotels look pretty good. And then that, and then uh, one of the big ones is the rent-a-car, C-A-R, um, I think is um, Avis budget. And that was a great thing to buy during the drop. And so that one's kind of hanging in there too, but that also got involved with the, the meme crowd, didn't it? Yeah, that jump up to 560. So maybe that one's not a good one. How about HTZ, the Hertz one? Or is it H? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, not much history here. Not that much history because, you know, they were in bankruptcy. They were supposed to go to zero. Then everybody was buying it at zero, thinking they were morons. Now it's at 24 bucks, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the rent a car is still the street, right? And then uh, let's just look at a couple of travel guys. Uh, Expedia, what's that? XP, EXP, Expedia yeah, and Bookings would be two of them. Uh, EXPE, that's my favorite, but that looks like it's giving it up a little bit, huh? Yeah, because, you know, the bookings, uh, they do well when people are traveling as well. A little bit head and shoulder either. Yeah. So, um, and then let's hit the casinos here. Um, uh, I thought one of the better looking ones was MGM. But even that is uh, in a rough racket right now. Looks a lot like the airlines, huh? Yeah. Wind doesn't look very good. And WYNN. Yeah. Oh, I guess, you know, there's a formation there where if it took out 92, you'd want to get in the game. But that's not what's happening I'm, right now. I'm actually surprised about that. One would think with, well, I guess they, you can't do a whole lot of gambling with a mask over your face, but yeah. <laughs> I would, I would think that people would resort to that. Um, yeah. Or they're doing online. Out of what about a local, uh, we got a local one here, uh, uh, Red Rock, uh, RRR. And that uh, was doing well, and it kind of gave it up a little bit too. But it's uh, kind of hanging in there still. But you can see it's no longer at the 58 area. And again, ABC. Yeah. So uh, there's, um, yeah. there's this one I was looking at the other day. Golden that owns the owns the stratosphere now. Oh. Well, if it breaks under uh, 43, they'll be calling them the uh, submarine hotel, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, and let's turn over to some a couple of things that are kind of out of favor here a little. Well, they're not really out of favor, but you know they're just hanging around. One is a um, an infrastructure play. Uh, let's look at the Freeport McMoran FCX. Uh, that seems to be hanging around a level where it either better start going up or it's going to give it up. What do you think? I was been sideways uh, on my charts, and yeah. it's it's uh, sitting right at the midline of the sunny bands, and has it's touched it of like six times now yeah and that typically means we're looking at a move up to me how about you doc what do you think of uh, freeport mac moran well it's uh, this is one of the ones that they consolidate forever until you finally get so bored with it you just you take your eye off the ball and then all of a sudden they'll move again yeah but this is definitely con and continuation consolidation setting up on this guy yeah, because you make a good point. Uh, between uh, March and September, it was consolidating between 32 and 36. And then in the last few months, it's been consolidating between 42 and 36. And right now it's right around 37, 36. So 
you know, uh, much ado about nothing is what you were kind of saying. And that's pretty much what it is, right? Yeah, just, just, you know, flat to the point where people, you know, can't take it anymore. So and also they're, they're it, it chops for... you up, you get short uh, when it right. breaks under 36, and then you make no money, and then you get long above 36. And now you're not making any money. So that's what you're talking about. People get frustrated and go, let's go elsewhere. Huh? Yeah, I'd rather trade something that's, you know, if you're going to go for a directional trade, go for something clean. Yeah, the, this is not this is more of a value deal than anything else, right? Because you're thinking uh, these guys are the leader in copper. Copper is in tight supply. They can't really mine much more of it because it's hard to get new mines going. Ergo, the longer term, if there is going to be this big uh, recovery and continuation of infrastructure, uh, this has a good story behind it. But all you need is Mansion going down there saying we're not going to do infrastructure, and there you go, right? Anyway, let's turn over to the other uh, dark horse, which is uh, Newmont Mining, N -E NEM. Sounds like uh, something from the Wizard of Oz, NEM. Huh? Uh, I don't know. You know, this thing is sneaky and it pays about 4% dividend. And it took so, me a while to get that joke. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, I had a lot of coffee. You guys didn't have as much coffee as me today. That's the problem. Um, no, seriously, on uh, NEM, uh, you are looking at a situation where, uh, you know, it's uh, come down from 75. It pays about 4% on your money. Uh, it obviously is not in the news as far as a big fancy stock is concerned. RSI is sneaking above 50. This thing starts trading 5860. Uh, maybe it's going someplace. What do you think? Uh, Sonny. Well, I don't know about that. That is definitely a sideways movement there. It's under... Well, I, I, I call this purple on top because the purple midline is above the gold midline on my sunny bands. Yeah. I think it's going on down a little further. Okay. I think it's going down to the 52.50 level. Yeah. My uh, buddy and me did an analysis on the price of gold, and it looks very similar to 2013, the chart. And uh, 2013, it broke to the downside. And um, we are thinking that there's still a potential for gold to break to the downside if it can't get on the bicycle. That's why I was thinking if this thing uh, did go the other way, 5860, it would give you a uh, it would give you a ride that's, uh, you know, kind of. Can we go back uh, on the uh, GOLD to uh, give it a I guess it would be a 10 year chart, five year chart, longer term chart. Uh, 2013, what happened in 2013? Yeah, I guess, uh, well, this isn't as easy to see, but we were just seeing a similar pattern, I guess, uh, going back about 10 years, it was a little easier to see that in 2013, it, it did some stuff and then it came down and broke to the downside. And we were looking at a similar pattern. Nice anyway, you, you're, you guys are thinking uh, that the, both gold and copper stocks are kind of at best going sideways at the current time with a possibility of a, a break in the gold uh, new month, right? I think we're going to have a break in the gold that you chart that you've got up down to the moving average. Yeah. And yeah. followed by another move up. Yeah. So they're going to do, there's going to be a, a laundry, uh, a laundry time. They're going to wash it out a little bit is what you think. I think so. Yeah. And again, from what our analysis was, uh, unless we get, you know, that uh, 1875, 1900 price going on gold, uh, that uh, what, what Sonny's talking about uh, could very well happen. Um, and the way the 10 year note is trading is if there is no inflation, you would uh, we'd think maybe that is. And the dollar, uh, you want to put up the US dollar DXY or uh, that darn thing, um, you know, has been firm as concrete. Do you have a feeling on the dollar, uh, Sonny? Well, that looks like a congestionary to me. It looks like a pennant. We've got uh, mm -hmm. it's squeezing in there. Prior mm -hmm. move was up. That usually says that the next move is going to be up. Yeah. Uh, Doc, do you have a feeling on the dollar? No, I don't really follow it, but I agree with what Sonny just said. You know, a lot of people are also talking about international. And um, do you guys have any uh, feelings or are you have enough to do uh, here in the 50 states? You don't really look overseas too much. What do you think, uh, Sonny? Do you have anything going on the international, either Europe, Asia or emerging markets? I don't look much at the international market. I do watch China, though. Yeah. Uh, things going on in China influence the whole world. They supply every trinket known to mankind these days. Right. So I do I watch that one. 
Uh, two things about China, if you put up BABA, it's a good example, is uh, obviously their stocks have already come down quite a bit. And also, they did not print money like the uh, newspaper during this drop. So they, uh, I think their uh, stimulus versus GDP was 7%. Ours is like over 100% or some crazy number. And so they have got a lot of room to um, uh, add reserves to their economy if they'd like. But, um, you know, these uh, prices, I mean, if you go back even further, you'll see it came down from 320 uh, all the way down to 110. And so this stock has lost two thirds of its value. And uh, they have a big data dump this week, China, where you're going to learn a lot about what's going on with their economy. And so if that uh, data dump is a uh, is stimulative for buying and selling, you could get some pretty big, ac big action in China by the end of the week. And they have that Olympics coming up in February, which people are talking about boycotting. So it sounds like a lot of, um, you know, what hitting the fan between their data dump and the, uh, the prices being depressed as also the um, Olympic uh, political stuff and the Taiwan talk. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. But uh, Doc, as far as you're concerned, uh, we got enough going on here in the U.S. After the Luckin Coffee debacle that happened a year or two ago, I, right. I will not even follow these stocks anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you say, there's plenty to do here, right? All right, well, as we're coming to the top of the hour, let's give a little bit of time before we run out of time to go over uh, what people can get uh, from each of your services and uh, a little bit of uh, any kind of uh, special offers you want to hand out. Let's start with Sonny. Sonny, a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the services you, uh, you give people and also if there's any uh, special offers. Well, I do have uh, indicators, the ones that I use every day on my own charts that are available uh, to anybody who wants to buy them, they're only for Trade Station and, and uh, one, Sunny Bands is available though now on Metastock as well. But um, I'd be I'd be okay with giving a twenty percent off. Uh, oh, for the next two weeks, well, I'll say till Christmas, twenty percent off on anything, including my consulting. But I do offer a free Sunday night uh, newsletter that I. Uh, called Sunny Side of the Street. I put out every Sunday night giving my opinions on the market and the configuration of the Sunny Bands. And I look at crypto and gold and bonds and, and uh, of course the ES and a few select stocks. So that's for free. And I have a live trading room that's also for free on Tuesday mornings. Sure. So people take advantage of that. That'd be a great idea. Uh, Doc, um, a little bit more about uh, what people can get from your services and any special offer. Sure. I just put up in the chat window, uh, our site is elite.readyset.trade. So you can uh, check that out. And really the most important thing versus trying to sell anybody something right now, just go ahead and sign up for free and be part of our community and see what it's all about. You can kick the tires so you can see what's available out there. So we have anything from static classes for many different things regarding technical analysis or option trading and strategies, or just reading the market to our newsletters that we have, as well as the, the live trading room that we do every morning. So there's a lot of depth to the service uh, as well as many different classes that people can pick up. But the, the first way to get started with this is for free. So just go ahead and join our, what we call the 10X tribe. And there's a bunch of stuff and that somebody can pick up for free right off the bat today. It takes you two seconds to sign up. And that's at elite.readyset.trade, which is in the chat window. Sure. Hey, uh, we got a minute or so here. Let's go over two things we didn't go over uh, because I think the, a lot of people are interested and that is uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, my feeling has always been 30 to 50% drops. That's when you want to get your checkbook out. Uh, that worked very well in July when we had that big drop. Uh, and now we're coming into that region again. So let's look at GBTC, which is the exchange uh, uh, traded thing rather than the actual Bitcoin. Um, do we see, uh, as you can see, you know, we've had a nice little drop of uh, whatever, looks like 60% or something like that, 50% anyway. Um, do we uh, think uh, either GBTC or ET H E uh, offer value down here, or what are you thinking? And we'll start with Sunny. I love Ethereum. Uh, it's not following Bitcoin down as strongly, 
Right. And it's held its value. I've been holding bit. Um, sorry, Ethereum ETH USD is what I buy. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, holding that since uh, twenty one hundred, and we're up at four thousand. Well, thirty eight fifteen now. Uh -huh. And I'm I'm holding on to it for the long term. Yeah. And uh, what about um, the um, the uh, ETF uh, ETHE? You think there's any value here in this? Uh... That's too thinly traded for me. Yeah, to I mean, take this isn't the one. one. Uh, this isn't. Uh, I don't think this is coin shares. Uh, the one I'm looking for is Grayscale. There you go. The Grayscale Trust. You know, the one that trades uh, millions of contracts a day. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, yeah, is there, is there any is there any value here um, uh, using this thirty area and basically saying it's not going to blow out twenty seven fifty, or on GBTC, you know, uh, something in the thirties here, not going to blow out the. Uh, the lows? It could blow out the lows. If you look at the resistance across the tops of those recent highs, uh -huh. it looks like it's it's under that right now. And being under it, could, it could go down farther. Yeah. Uh, any line in the sand to use, or is it just abject uh, gambling? <laughs> I don't gamble. Well, but, you know, I'm trying uh, to say, I mean, if you're catching something that is above all everything and it's just dropping and dropping and dropping, you know, there's really no rhyme or reason to it you know well i i buy every time you make new lows yeah yeah uh doc do you have a feeling on either um uh, uh ethe grayscale or gbtc i agree with what uh sunny just said about ethereum ethereum is technically a lot stronger the consolidation is much tighter up near the top and unfortunately it's just leaving a volume profile area so it may have a little bit further to drop before it does find some uh some support. I've been holding Ethereum. I got in late. I got in at two hundred and thirty-five dollars, but uh, so I'm holding that one long term as well too. Yeah, Bitcoin does look a little bit. Just the the, the whole crypto market right now is just a sea of red today, down yeah. eight eight to ten percent. So I don't know if this is, has something to do with China's cracking further down on their holders or whatever it is. But uh, so to me, Ethereum wins out over Bitcoin at this point. If these things are stores of value and in some regard, obviously you don't need a store of value if the dollar is going to be extremely strong and inflation is going to go away. So if, uh, you know, the Fed generally wins their wars at some point, you know, they had a war on unemployment when it was at 10%, look at unemployment today. And if their next war is on inflation, they're probably going to win that too over time. And maybe that's putting a little bit of uh, wet, uh, damp water on this stuff as well. But uh, one of the things about Ethereum that uh, people like is that they have made a commitment to go all green by 2022 next year. And of course, uh, the uh, using of coal and other pollutants to make the Bitcoin has been a negative. And so, uh, you know, maybe uh, that's another reason why the Ethereum has gotten a little bit better legs than the Bitcoin. But uh, we are at the top of the hour. So basically, I just wanted to uh, uh, tell everybody that uh, they can contact Sonny or Doc and get the information. As far as uh, we're concerned, optionprofessor.com. We have a weekly uh, newsletter we sent out that's free of charge. So just go to optionprofessor.com and you can uh, put in your email and get it uh, next Friday. Right now, I'm sending it back over to David. Uh, David, we certainly uh, went over the universe of stuff and uh, these two uh, speakers certainly have got a lot to offer. So hopefully people can take advantage of that as well. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, great uh, show today. Lots of good information. Also, um, just uh, before we end the show here, I just wanna mention too that um, uh, if you saw what happened in Kentucky over the weekend, that's um, the worst of that damage was uh, right near where I grew up, or where I grew up. Um, uh, I grew up in Paducah, Kentucky. And so, uh, as you probably saw, there was dozens of people killed and uh, thousands of homes damaged and, and uh, a lot of, uh, so a lot of people hurting right now in Kentucky. So if you uh, can afford to donate anything. There's um, a few different organizations um, taking donations. So just want to mention real fast, if you can, if you can give anything, they, they really need it. So um, easiest way is to just Google Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund, and you can, uh, can donate some money there. So um, just wanted to uh, mention that here at the end of the show. But uh, just a reminder for everyone, be sure to subscribe to Time Your Research on YouTube. 
and your favorite podcast app. And you can also go to timingresearch.com to get access to the recording of this episode as soon as I can get it posted. So just want to thank my guests again for today, Doc Severson of readyset.trade and Sonny Harris of moneymentor.com and the option professor of optionprofessor.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thank you, Jim.